the contingencies, um, you know, there are a whole variety of contingencies and whether they are owned by the contract or owned by the employer and whether it's a, it's a different category like a management reserve, et cetera, et cetera. Perhaps you can just summarize for us briefly how the JBC, and I'm thinking of, if I can call it the major works or the principal agreement deals with, uh, with contingencies. Um, so, um, uh, if one looks at the nature of contracts, from what I understand, there are two broad categories. There are what is generally known as fixed uh, cost contracts. Yes. And then to use an overseas term of cost plus contracts. And we yes. use, in South Africa, I think we use the term variable cost contracts. So yes. from, from, you know, in a fixed cost contracts environment, and there are very nuances to fixed cost contracts, including the uh, CPA that you mentioned. Yes. Um, you know, provision needs to be made for um, events that are unforeseen or unexpected or, you know, the, the sort of known unknowns and um, and even, uh, and I'm Variation. assuming that the JBCC does not deal with uh, the unknown unknowns. Um, and I know that there are some complex terms used that we don't use on a day-to-day -day basis, um, like budgetary amounts and uh, allowances and, um, you know, prime costs and, uh, you mm. know, provisional sums and, uh, you know, uh, uh, and all the rest of it. Um, so I'm just trying to get a sense of, of, of um, you know, the quality of the JBCC's principal works agreements in dealing with such contingencies. Mm. Okay, no, thank you. Um, that helps me a lot, just to really appreciate what you're asking. So in so far as you were using the JBCC PBA in terms of a fixed term contract, um, yes, one would want to include CPA, a CPA clause, but it's not that the contract is without a variations clause. And it's in terms of there is variations, whether it be um, additional work or things that uh, vary the scope because they were unforeseen, et cetera, et cetera. Your variations clause, um, which is often accompanied by um, whether it's a, it's a BOQ to deal with variations or a schedule of rates, et cetera, it's your variations clause that will then entitle you um, or as the contractor to be able to say, well, I've been asked to do this. This was unforeseen and it's come about. How do I value that? You'll value it in terms of the variations provisions within the PBA, which also um, go into a little bit of detail about if it's of a similar nature, if it's not, uh, what the extent of the variation can be. So um, it's not that the uh, PBA is without that type of contingency. Um, it is there. And um, you bring up something which is really important is that what I'm talking about, and I'm not propagating for massive uh, changes to these contracts, but what we are dealing with here is we are talking about the general conditions of contracts for all of these contracts. And these conditions need to be amended only to the extent that they do to cater for the specific projects. So a really big contingency that we have is whatever contract we choose, and particularly the JVC PBA, is you have to have a look at, well, this is what this project entails. And in order to put in contingencies in place, in order to make this a fair and balanced uh, contracting form, particularly where you've chosen a fixed price, um, you can write in special conditions that will then amend the general conditions or amplify the general conditions in order to cater for the contingencies that you've spoken about. So it's not set in stone. These are just the basic uh, I don't want to use the word preliminaries, these are the general conditions that we're dealing with. And sometimes they do need to be amended, amplified, updated to mm. cater for the particular project and to cater for the contingencies that need to be made in relation to that project. So then let's just see what France has got to say. And then Pravesh, I think, has also got a contribution. Go ahead, France. 
Good morning, everybody. Sean and Nadine. Um, just maybe to come in here with regard to contingencies uh, being a financial allowance. Um, you know, from a financial perspective, contingencies is there to provide for unforeseen costs which may arise. Now, when we as quantity surveyors do feasibilities, you have two contingencies. You've got a project contingency, which typically is there to cover unknown items, which is part of uh, design issues, which may be due to the fact that you at the time of, of doing feasibilities may not have sufficient information. So typically uh, on building projects, a quantity surveyor then decides he's got good volume of information, good detailed information. So he decides on a say uh, three to 5% worst case contingency provision. Um, then you also get a development contingency uh, which is typically your developer's allowance for unforeseen weather circumstances and unforeseen events that may arise beyond the control of the contractor and the contracting team. So you've got two contingencies. Now, many years ago, uh, a legal president caused the ASAQS, Association of Quantity Surveyors of South Africa, to issue a practice note with regard to how to handle contingencies in primarily or specifically the, the JBCC scenario, because JBCC, uh, going back to the original CIDB, was the preferred contract type for building projects. And I'm not talking civil contracts, I'm talking building contracts, whereby they made a recommendation that uh, contingencies be excluded from a, an amount provision in the bills of quantities um, and that came as a result of a, of a legal case that actually awarded the, the value of the contingencies to the contractor. Now, uh, you know, if you think back what the purpose of a contingency is, is to provide for unforeseen costs. Now, if you've got a proper bill of quantities and a proper contract, the contracting team and, and obviously the quantity surveyor managing the financial aspects will actually manage the cost. So you don't need a separate contingency allowance in the contract itself. You on the project side should provide for that. So uh, be careful. Do not include things that, that, that nobody can manage and nobody can decide and dictate. Um, rather make it a, a, a contract value excluding contingencies and then on the same vein also do not provide and include a provisional sum or an amount for CPAP escalation. Same thing there, a court president has allocated the amount which in that instance was also an excessive allowance by the by the uh, consulting team to the contractor for because he then at the, the interpretation was that he was uh, do that money or he was allowed to expect the money to be forthcoming to him. So be careful not to allow and include items like contingencies and CPAP in the contract. Thanks, France. Let's uh, go to Pravesh and then we can go back to Adin. Hi, Pravesh. You, you're in uh, works in KZN. Yes, yes, thank you. It's, uh, yeah, morning, morning, Sean and colleagues. Um, I think I want to concur with what France is saying as well, as well as uh, yeah, the previous speaker as well. But my, my take is that in government, what generally happens, I mean, I think France, you, you're quite correct in saying that we shouldn't put that as part of the contract value. But often we see that uh, uh, when we award in, in government, we, we add it as a, as a contract value. And then it's sort of an open checkbook for contractors because they see that contingency. And most of the time it's either five or 10%. And they find a way of utilizing that contingency uh, within the contract. But then the other spin is, I mean, you know, we've got the JBCC, but we also have the IDMS, which is your infrastructure delivery management system, which uh, seemingly was taken over by the uh, yeah, FIP, FIPDM. Um, yeah, the, yeah. So, so, so we, we should have a sign off on the design or the different stages or the delivery uh, gates so that we don't get to a stage where you have unforeseen. Now, we understand that they are unforeseen and they are unforeseen. I mean, you can't predict what is below a foundation if you can hit rock. Uh, so that would be something. But then again, I, I see my colleague from Treasury is also on the thing, Sishle Mia. Uh, they, they've issued uh, instruction notes on the variation orders, which you can then not exceed more than 20% to simply prevent uh, the overspending on, on these type of projects. So we, we, we from, from past experience, we have noted, I mean, you, you have this here and you, you'll find, I think, 
most contractors, uh, they, they, they will find a way of, of issuing a variation order on anything. So the, the entire thing was to sort of, you know, bring with the FIPDM to try and curtail the expenditure uh, so that you don't uh, start increasing the scope because you should have planned the project from onset and know what the actual uh, infrastructure um, cost is going to be upfront so that you also meet your timelines uh, in terms of cost quality and time. Um, but again, I think the contingency is it is and still is uh, an open checkbook. Thanks.